Hello, and welcome to Rapid Fire, a podcast hosted by Firedex, dedicated to sharing best practices and lessons learned in hopes of making firefighting a little bit safer. I'm your host, Bob Keyes, a retired battalion chief from FDNY. Today, we're going to discuss managing issued personal protective equipment. We are fortunate to be joined by Burnaby Fire Chief Chris Bocock, also joined by Paul Rushton, who's the treasurer of the Burnaby Firefighters Local 323. Also joined by Vancouver Fire Department Acting Lieutenant Kevin Tomic, who is the chair of the IFF Local 18 PPE Committee. Welcome, gentlemen. For those listeners not familiar with their Canadian geography, Burnaby is a neighboring city to Vancouver with over 400 career firefighters and a population of about 260,000 residents. Before we get started, I would like each of our participants to take a minute or less to tell everyone listening an interesting fact about their firefighting career. Can I start with you, Chief Bocock? Yeah, thanks, Bob. I'm uh, the fire chief of the City of Burnaby Fire Department, 26-year member of this department. My uncle was in this department, so I come through a very traditional way. I dealt with rebuilding our PPE hygiene program and issue of second gear to all members. I take hygiene and PPE pretty serious. I spent years teaching live fire at the Justice Institute of BC to recruits and, and professional firefighters alike. And also my uncle, who I previously mentioned, died of line of duty, death, cancer related to his exposure back in the days when our PPE wasn't so wholesome. Well, thanks for sharing that, Chief. I can see where your passion comes from. Uh, The cancer epidemic is a scourge to the fire service and glad to hear that there are people that are dedicating their lives to making a difference for firefighters everywhere. You'll be able to add some very valued info on this podcast. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, My name is Paul Rushton. I've been on the department 20 years. I've been on the union executive for 10 years. And on behalf of myself, uh, my president, Jeff Clark, Secretary Miles Ritchie, and Vice President Scotty Allen, uh, our team is very passionate uh, with regards to the health and safety of our members in our department. I've been on the Occupational Health and Safety Committee for 14 years with the City of Burnaby. I sit on the committee with the city. I also sit on the BC Provincial Occupational Health and Safety Committee as well. So uh, health and safety is definitely uh, something that is passionate in, in my, um, my background. Um, I also was a suppression firefighter up uh, to about three years ago where I suffered a uh, career-ending injury and now have taken on a new role in the fire prevention division along with uh, that sort of other side of the fence, which is health and safety to our members from a frontline view making sure that our buildings and our city is safe for them when they enter and do suppression firefighting uh, tactics. So uh, definitely a a different career path moving forward to the end of my retirement. But uh, yeah, all in all, uh, definitely our union local 323 supports uh, our fire chief uh, Bocock in uh, making sure that our members are well equipped with turnout gear, clothing, and everything necessary to do the job in the community. Thanks, Paul. Kevin? Tell some uh, interesting stuff about you. Uh, thanks, Bob, and, and thanks to your team for having us on this morning and allow us to speak about some of the processes that we're using up here in uh, Vancouver and the general area of the Lower Mainland. Before I started the fire service, my employment was in the construction industry and the occupational health and safety. When I got onto the fire service in 2003, I got involved with our safety committee on our job. And from there, I progressed into learning more about how turnout gear is designed and used and proper procedures for cleaning and decontamination. From there, we've, I've processed into uh, moving with um, our health and safety committee and, and getting our members the best gear out there for our staff to have on the front lines. From that, I've also joined Paul and other members of the Lower Mainland departments in sitting on the Provincial Health and Safety Committee, where we're able to share a lot of ideas and move move projects forward because even though we're different fire departments, we're all trying to achieve the same goal. And that's, you know, cancer reduction and the improvement of safety for our members. Hopefully with programs like this and also us all working together, we can collectively make cancer something of the past within the fire service. And that's my goal once I started getting into the health and fire service. And I hope to see that this is start of some big changes for us, not only for our health, but also for our safety. Excellent. Thanks, Kevin. What I'd like to dig into is a contrast and a a comparison between Vancouver's policies of responding to working fires with a supply of extra spare PPE so they can decon and take firefighters 
primary gear as opposed to the very successful policy in Burnaby where each firefighter is issued two sets of personal protective equipment and is able to just switch into a second customized set of gear. Chief, if you could explain on-scene preliminary exposure reduction in Burnaby after a structural fire. Yeah, thanks, Bob. So for each one of our members, they're issued two sets of turnout gear, two sets of turnout boots right from day one, as well as all the hoods or balaclavas and gloves. So multiple sets of gear. So really, we have members responding to fire wearing bunker gear, interacting with the fire. We'll do gross decon. Uh, we'll do some finer decontamination. And then while on scene, we have uh, the second set of gear that's at the station brought down uh, for the companies that need to change out. The idea being there that if we can get them into gear that properly fits them, that they're comfortable with, that they care for, that they're used to, they feel comfortable, we can get them back in the uh, apparatus, back in service, taking calls right away. Now, we, we try not to roll them from event to event, but you know what it's like in the fire service. It's busy and our folks are already always ready to go to work. We need to give them the tools to do that and to do that safely, as opposed to, you know, a need for a rescue on your way back to the station and you're you're forced to get back into some gear that's unsafe for you and making some decisions that we'd all would make and all have made in the past that the more we learn about, we, we shouldn't put that decision making on the folks. Very interesting. Chief, could you explain the logistics of that? Who would be responsible for going to the various stations to pick up the second set of gear and get bringing it to the scene? Well, in the city of Burnaby, we operate engine companies, ladder companies, and rescue companies. So typically we would have a unassigned rescue company go by, pick up the appropriate gear. Uh, depending on how busy we are, we bring in either overtime staff or we'd utilize engine and ladder companies if possible. But we would pick up that gear, bring it down to the site, and then have it there so that um, the folks can grab it. Many departments of the bigger departments to lead the edge, Toronto's and Edmonton's, and now Vancouver's looking at it as well, as an actual decon unit, you know, almost like a, a mobile shower vehicle where people kind of do a walk through and do a little more than that gross decon, they actually wash up. And we're talking about putting everyone's second set of gear at the change of shift. It would pick up the gear and then come down to the, uh, the scene and, and that's how it would change over. But that's in the future for now. Innovative, I like the idea. Definitely uh, not having to bring contaminated bunker gear back to the fire hall uh, is a plus for everybody. Uh, Kevin, if you could share with us what Vancouver's policy is for uh, handling contaminated bunker gear. Okay, well, our process is a little different. We don't have two sets of gear for everyone, but we like to advertise to our membership that we have unlimited access to turnout gear for them to change into. We have a cross-staffed unit from an engine company over to our air light unit, which has rehab supplies, decon equipment, and bottle filling capabilities, which also is accompanied by our clothing wagon, which has roughly about 150 sets of turnout gear on it varying in sizes from our smallest size to our largest size, along with gloves and hoods and anything else, uh, helmet liners and equipment that is required for a member to change out on scene. And so when a working structure fire comes in in Vancouver, that cross-staff apparatus gets dispatched to the, the scene anywhere within the city, and we set up preliminary gross decon on scene, rehab uh, sector, and then from there, the members, once they're done on scene, can then get changed into um, another set of turnout gear, which is matching their current sizing that they're wearing. Now, we do have some abnormals um, on our job that require uh, a second set that they have, is similar to the Burnaby process, and those are our members that are pushing six foot five plus, and it's just impossible to have a secondary set available to them at any time and so we've issued some of our members the sizes that are not the average size in, within our department and so they have their second set but this allows us to constantly be changing out turnout gear uh, on scene and multiple times throughout an event and so some of the circumstances that we've had in case is once that member's gone through gross decon 
and come through the clothing wagon process where they've now had another set of gear issued to them. It then allows them to go back into service, similar to the Burnaby model. But if they were to then receive a second structure fire in their shift, we then have the capabilities of switching out their turnout gear again. Once they're switched out, then everything is bagged and tagged as per our policies and sent off to our in-house cleaning facilities where it's then processed and then given back to the member or it's sent back to the clothing wagon determining where it is assigned to. Excellent, Kevin. Thanks for sharing that. You're the first department I've seen across North America that had that response of a cache of generic sized bunker gear and was able to switch it out. I know we're, we're living through some unprecedented times with contamination, with civil disturbances in the U.S., where firefighters are going to multiple structure fires in one shift. How would Burnaby handle if both sets of their issued gear were contaminated? What would the policy be then? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, so we also have maintained a cache of kind of universal sizes or sizes throughout the entire range of our people. Um, at our station one. So at that point, we would have the company come down to station one and size up, suit up. We're, we're lucky that geographically we're not too big, we're very dense, but we're, we can easily get our released companies from an event to station number one and size and provide them with new gears. Hopefully not necessary too often to have to go to a third set of gear, but great to know that you do have that capability. Let's talk about in-house decon. So Kevin, you just mentioned that you guys have uh, the capability in station to wash contaminated bunker gear. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, last year we really ramped up our in-house washing of our turnout gear for our members. This was put through a stringent review of the NFP 1851 and some of the best practices that we could adopt. We have three stations currently in Vancouver that do our gear washing. And from that, we meet the 1851 standard and also exceed it in some areas after speaking to some of my colleagues. And with the in-house cleaning, we can usually return a member's gear. Our goal is 48 hours, and it's been as short as 24 hours uh, to have that gear replaced back to that member. So with our process, every member has their primary set, which is the one through five. So that gear is always assigned to them. And then the, once their gear is retired after year five, it then goes into our clothing wagon process or our clothing wagon uh, cache. And from there, that any gear that's washed in house then gets sent back to our station number 13, which has the uh, clothing wagon housed at, and then that's where all the gear goes. So moving forward, you know, washing gear as it gets more technical and the inspection process and everything that's uh, required, we are looking at a quartermaster system that you would have an assigned personnel um, to that division and that it would be strictly their job of maintaining and inspecting and cleaning of the turnout gear. And I see some departments down south have already adopted this um, position and we hope to have one soon as it makes more things more efficient and you know to clean the gear and get it back to the members a lot faster, especially when you're doing in-house cleaning. Great. Thanks for sharing that. So just to clarify, does Vancouver use an independent service provider to do the advanced inspections right now, or is that in-house also? Currently, our advanced inspections are done by an independent service provider. Logistically, this is where where we start to get as a little bit larger of a department. This is where we're having some of those issues of making sure that those are done on an annual basis and tracking down the members, where their gear is, and all that stuff. And so we we're hoping to have a position in place that can monitor that at all times so that we can make sure that these, the, the testing and the service intervals are being matched per the standard. Thanks, Kevin. So in Burnaby, are we using a uh, ISP or are you guys also doing in-house inspections and cleaning? Uh, Paul here. Um, We've worked hard uh, with our Occupational Health and Safety Committee and the management team along with the union and the city. Uh, We're fortunate that every single one, we have seven stations or seven fire halls, and every single one of our fire halls have a washing unit. Uh, So our members can do it in-house at their station. Upon returning, we have high-end units. Uh, We've got dryer systems at each one of the halls. 
So uh, we have a very stringent decontamination procedure that was adopted, very similar to uh, Kevin. I think Kevin and myself came up with it for the BC. Uh, we're on scene, uh, we bag, tag, uh, write it all down, make sure that gear uh, never sees the light of day outside of that bag until it's uh, either wetted down prior to getting into the washing extractor or it goes into the extractor and uh, is washed immediately upon returning to the hall or at the end of shift it's left and uh, with the assistance of the opposite crew, uh, they're able to manage it and get it ready for the next day's tour. Our in-house facility that does all the inspection of our turnout gear happens to be in our own backyard about a five minute drive from our station one and uh, they do all the inspection and everything as far as our turnout gear goes and uh, it's close to home so it provides us that extra advantage to uh, get our gear uh, looked at uh, fairly quickly. Awesome thank you Paul. Just to close the uh, topic on preliminary exposure reduction I've seen some really innovative equipment in photos from a, a presentation that Kevin you, you've done uh, around the country about Vancouver's air light unit so I did just see a picture of a glove decon uh, device that you guys deploy on the seat of fires. Could you give a description about that as well as the uh, way you guys clean off your SCBA cylinders? Uh, after doing some research and, and speaking with some of the people that sit on the NFPA technical committee there, the importance of washing gloves and how dirty they are, but also the best practices of washing gloves and putting them through the extractors were probably not the best process that we were following. And so one of the things we came up with is how can we wash the set of gloves without putting them through the extractor? And hopefully the, you know, the internal part of the glove is not dirty, but going through the extractor, having all that soiled water go inside the glove and then for the spin cycle not to extract it and then just dry possible particulate matter and contaminants inside the glove. We decided to think outside the box on how we can actually develop an on-scene decon of our gloves. Seeing how expensive PPE is and we just don't have the budget for constantly replacing, we looked at building a, a contraption uh, simply enough out of um, a plastic container with four brush heads in there where a member then can place their hand inside and it's a, a vigorous scrub on the outer shell of the glove to hopefully re you know, remove most of the contaminants on there. And then once they go into the next step within our decon corridor, they then get a full body scrub with brushes and soap. And at that time, the glove is rinsed off. Their glove is then placed on a drying rack once they're back at the station. And majority of our members have issued two sets of gloves. And once they have their second set, they then utilize that as their primary. And while their, their, their other set that was just washed is now placed onto a drying rack for them to then monitor and make sure it's ready to go for their next time of use. And so with the contraption that we built, we feel that it's, it's doing the job. Otherwise, if we do have a heavily soiled glove that is unable, it's, it's got paint or it's got something on it, tar, uh, we have the capabilities on our clothing wagon as well to replace uh, the structural glove on scene with a member if we're unable to clean it. And we've only started this in the last month and we're seeing some great results from it uh, as members are really buying into cleaning their gloves on scene and then taking them back to the station and drying them. It's helped our inventory on our clothing wagon to stay at a, a large consignment. And so we don't have the gloves going out every time someone's exchanging their gear out. And it seems to be a success that we're working towards. And we hopefully that this is a contamination reduction instead of the gloves going through the washing or through the extractor. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Kevin. I know Chief, you had talked about possibly getting a, a decon trailer to respond to structural fires. Are you specifically deconning SCBA on scene? Are you deconning helmets on scene? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, what we're looking at is some of the products that are being utilized in Europe for cleaning those hard pieces of equipment, specifically the SCBA. It's, the SCBA is kind of that hybrid piece of equipment that um, has both soft components right, that easily absorbed and need to be washed, and also the hard components that there's not a big deal, that they're easy to wash. But what we've seen in Europe is, and there's some manufacturers in California that provide them, these washing machines that you can put helmets in, you can put radios, all your hard equipment, everything non-textile. And we've all gotten the back of uh, engine or ladder apparatus back in the day where we know the young 
Firefighters have cleaned the SCBA as well, but the next day you can sure smell the smoke coming off of them. So we're looking at that next level of how we can decontaminate that equipment. Even though we're, we're, we're moving to moving that equipment out of the cab of the truck to this clean cab practices, we still wanna make sure it's clean. Um, and so we're looking at some of those washers and how to change out. Currently we'll change out our SCBAs on scene through our uh, heavy rescues and give the folks clean packs before they put them back on the truck. We'll bring those packs back to our station uh, number one, uh, where we do some of our advanced cleaning and we're looking at how to clean that equipment more effectively. Fantastic, Chief. Great information. Appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to move on to a couple other very hot button topics affecting us these days. Uh, most importantly, COVID-19 and how it's impacted departments. Kevin, can you share how this virus has impacted day-to-day -day operations in Vancouver Fire Department? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been quite interesting times, and I'm sure a lot of other people are experiencing that as well. Some of the benefits that we're seeing from it is our decontamination within the fire halls uh, and the importance of once the, the shift change happens, that the on-duty crew is then uh, spending a quite amount of time, and we completely disinfect the hall. So our standard is um, you're, you're sort of clean in. And so every time a shift starts is that new shift is decontaminating the hall uh, once all the members from the previous shift have left. And now that station is clean for those members. Uh, we've been very fortunate that we have not had a positive case uh, within our membership. And I think it has a lot to do with some of the practices that we've adopted and, and making sure that we're keeping ourselves clean. On scene, uh, any time that our, we've responded, uh, we're a basic a first responder program uh, because we have the provincial ambulance service here so it'd be similar to a state-run ambulance service and our call volume that's been dictated by them is been reduced because we're not going to a lot of the calls of our typical um, small injuries uh, just for the reduction of exposure to the first responders and so our call volume has gone down we're lucky enough to have access to um, good selection of PPE which includes Tyvek suits, proper face gowns, kind of, or like a mask, and proper respiratory protection. And so our members are responding to all calls with Tyvek suits, an N95 or better mask, and also a face shield. We have gone to some of the cases where a child's hurt and there's a little bit of explaining to do, and we try to calm people down because we don't look like the average fire department responding anymore. And so it has been quite a difference in that aspect as well. But, I, you know, I'm just glad to see that uh, our membership has really bought into some of the initiatives that our, our task force has come up with. And it is sure making a difference. And we can see that with no positive cases within our membership. And just, you know, we're, we're following the practices. And I think that uh, we're staying safe. And I, I hope that we continue that through this whole pandemic that we're able to maintain the, the zero positive tests. I think many of you have heard that at one point, FDNY had 2,000 members out on medical leave due to exposure or positive test results. Out of a workforce of 15,000, it made a huge impact and they had to revisit the policy of not being quarantining firefighters just because they had been exposed, uh, waiting until they became symptomatic, only because the, the numbers of manpower were dwindling so quickly. Chief, how about in, in Burnaby? How has the COVID-19 impacted uh, your staff and did you have to quarantine anybody? Yeah, thanks, Bob. We've had a, a few cases where we've had potential exposures. Um, we've kind of played a really strong role in making sure we aren't bringing that virus into the station via our emergency work. We've been very effective with that, but we've had a few members who had some potential exposures who we put off on leave just to make sure that they tested negative before we allowed them back in the station. Uh, really hard on those people. They feel uh, they let the team down. You know, our people are ready to go and always want to be there for their compatriots, but um, they help us in a different way by staying home and we, we make sure we cover their time. The other piece that we kind of looked at, you know, I'll, I'll mirror all the sentiments that Vancouver, I mean, they've, they've set a great practice and we learn a lot from them and, and follow them in many ways. We did diverge though, really early in the virus when we weren't sure how and what was going on. We went to Tyvek suits as well and still wear SCBAs 
to all events where we could aerosolize the virus by compressions, artificial res respirations, bagging, uh, or oxygen therapy. That's a pretty drastic step. One of the key reasons is we didn't want to compete with the healthcare industry for the N95 mask. Uh, we hear stories of fire departments and nurses and all those frontline workers having to reuse N95 masks uh, on multiple occasions or for multiple days or, or, or trying to find inventive ways to do non-certified sterilization. And we as a core unit, union and management, we sat down and said, we, can, we wanna do whatever we can do not to compete with those people who have no choice but to wear N95. So we have an ability to wear SCBAs, we know how to do that. Our decontamination process looks like a hazmat scene. So we're getting really good. Our, all of our engine companies and ladder companies have really rose to the challenge. Um, we're really good with SCBA work. We're extremely good now with hazmat style decon by your base engine and ladder companies. We're pretty proud of the commitment our people have made at their own discomfort to really display some of our core values to, to those other frontline workers. That's amazing, Chief. I have not heard of any other department that is doing CPR with an SCBA on. Uh, you're certainly cutting edge uh, getting in front of this, and I think that's honorable to not be one of the causes of having a shortage of N95 masks for the healthcare industry. My hat goes off to you. Not sure if we've uh, had much incidence of pushback towards police reform in your cities. Um, I'm sure you've had some peaceful protests as they seem to be happening in every city. Has there been any need to change policies when being called to EMS calls or any type of emergency while there are protests going on? Please chime in if you want to share. We had some protests around sort of political protests a couple of years back. So we've had some experience in Burnaby, not quite civil disobedience, but definitely congregations of protest. Um, we haven't had to change anything really as far as that goes. Just to be more aware, it, it ties in with the COVID thing as well, you know, that people aren't at their best right now. So what we're trying to make sure our folks understand, you know, that we are now we're really getting people on their worst day. There's a lot of people who are overwhelmed. I know we have issues with increased number of overdoses, not to the extent of some other cities. Uh, but we're starting to see uh, signs of people who are kind of overdone. So our, our folks have been really good about assessing that and really seeing people in trouble and those manifestations of frustration, working around them, accepting them as, as, uh, uh, as the conditions we work in and just trying to deliver all those pinnacle pieces of influence that the fire service uh, and the IFF are so known for across North America. And really, in this tough time, being, uh, being that pinnacle that people can rely on. So we're proud of our folks for that. Kevin, you want to share with everybody what we talked about uh, previously about de-escalation training? Yeah, thanks, Bob. You know, with everything that's going on in the uh, world today, and, and of course, our environment is not as hostile as some other cities within North America is we work close hand in hand with our partners with the Vancouver Police and also the BC Ambulance Service on scene. We're all in a uh, dark navy blue uniform. Uh, we're seen by the public as one. And so we've tried to uh, adopt some of the new practices coming out and what's been lessons learned and everything on scene of de-escalation. And not only is this for hostile environments, but also for mental health issues. It just seems to be growing more and more within our response models. We're hoping that we can get some in-house training for our company officers and then right down to our firefighters on the improvements of how to respond to a hostile situation or also a mental health situation and de-escalate the situation so that our membership isn't being perceived as the agitators uh, when they arrive on scene, they're there to help. And regardless of the person's on how bad their day is, um, they can help recognize that we've been summoned for their assistance and we can hopefully, you know, they, they buy into that and we can also train our membership on how to assist that further with some simple communications. 
Yeah, vitally important, especially when you see these videos of uh, fire trucks being attacked with bricks, the anger level and the frustration of people being quarantined or being out of work and financially struggling, uh, it seems to have brought out uh, a lot of tension and anxiety. Paul, I noticed from your bio that you're a member of the Burnaby Firefighters Charitable Society. I'm sure firefighters, uh, specifically in the U.S., are not familiar with that. I was wondering if you could spend a couple minutes and just tell us what the Charitable Society uh, does, what its purpose is, and how it's organized. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, our Burnaby Firefighters Charitable Society is a society that all the union executive members are uh, the directors and all our members participate in raising funds and money for our society. Uh, usually pre-COVID, uh, we'd have some major events like our charitable ball, which has been running for almost 30 years straight. Uh, we have a charitable golf tournament. Uh, we've got a healthy snack food program where we contribute healthy snack foods to all the elementary schools in our city and our community centers. So we reach out and uh, we're able to provide snacks to uh, the underfunded and those that uh, go to school hungry. We also provide CPR training for all the high schools in the grade 10s as part of our uh, charitable society. And uh, most recently with COVID, uh, we had an opportunity to identify over 400 families uh, that were in need of food and they were identified by the school system. And our members rose to the challenge over three days and volunteered all their own time. That's one thing that's very important to note is that uh, we volunteer our time in the community. So everything part of the charitable society and we give back to the community. And we have a great relationship with our new mayor, uh, who was an ex-firefighter uh, of our department, which is special and unique that we're able to coordinate with our department, our city mayor, and our, our members of Local 323 to deliver that product back to the community. Uh, we've uh, done things like uh, help feed the homeless. We are instrumental not only from an emergency response, uh, but also on the other side in the charitable response, being able to give back to the community and be a special part of that so that uh, we work hand in hand with everybody so that uh, our citizens of our community are definitely looked after. So the Burnaby Firefighters Charitable Society is very, very special. And uh, we uh, definitely pride ourselves and our members on their volunteering time and giving back to the community. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. That, that's an honorable calling, true to the core of what firefighters are all about, selflessly giving of themselves to uh, help protect and, and save the lives, uh, give better quality of life to the citizens that live in our community that we serve. Fantastic. With that, I want to thank all three of you gentlemen for taking your time today to uh, share your experiences and innovative ways to make firefighting a little bit safer. Um, look forward to talking to you all in the future to see how these new innovative ideas pan out. And I uh, want to say thank you and have a fantastic day. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. We appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Rapid Fire. Follow Firedex on social media or visit firedex.com for podcast updates or products and news.